All right, we're talking now with Massachusetts State Senate Minority Leader Bruce Tarr. And Senator Tarr, middle of summer. God, this year is going fast. How are you doing? Well, it is going fast, Rick, but these days I'm happy to be anywhere where there's air conditioning because it's been my observation that this is one of the longest streaks we've had in recent memory with hot and humid weather. I mean, my observation is that you might get a couple of days, but not an extended period the way that we've had it until recently. Yeah, and all the greenery is starting to uh, burn out again. So uh, obviously yeah. uh, the drought situation in many cities and towns uh, on the North Shore um, is causing these water uh, uh, restrictions. It definitely is, and it always becomes a concern this time of year. I think we're fortunate that we've had a lot of rain, and so it's taken a while to get into those drought restrictions. But now that they're here, um, we continue to live under the pressure of what could potentially be a prolonged drought. I'm not a meteorologist. I don't even play one on TV. Uh, but this is the time of year we have to start to think about those things. <laughs> Well, maybe you could play the president on the on TV. So that, I, I, would, <laughs> I don't know I would about watch that, Rick. That. I don't know I about watch, that. <laughs> I would watch that. Yeah. All right, let's get down to it. You've been very, very busy, uh, and that's another reason, I guess, why time goes so fast. And here we are in the actually we're toward the end of July now, and what's been in the news almost every single day has to do with budget and budget issues. So bring us up to date. Sure. So. Unfortunately, Rick, this was another year where we didn't have a budget in place by the beginning of the fiscal year on July 1st, uh, but we have made good progress. And so uh, we approved uh, a final version of the what is known as the General Appropriations Act, the state budget for fiscal year 2025, which is the year that actually began on July 1st. We approved that version on Friday and sent it to the governor's desk, and she has 10 days from Friday to be able to take a various suite of actions as she chooses to see fit, um, whether that be vetoes or sending things back with amendment or uh, modifying things for our consideration. So we're not done yet, uh, but we've made it a significant way through the, the budget process. And we're about 17 days late uh, so far in terms of not having a budget. And it's really unfortunate, Rick. And in floor remarks, I indicated that I, I hope this wouldn't continue to happen. Um, while we didn't miss by as much as we have in, in other years, in fact, this year, uh, the House and Senate voted on the budget uh, approximately 12 days earlier than last year. So we're moving in the right direction. But there's no reason we shouldn't be able to get the budget done and, and have discipline to be able to do that. A couple of quick things about the budget. It does not increase taxes, which is very important. It increases by about three and a half percent over the prior fiscal year, which ended on June 30th of 2024. Um, and that's about $2 billion, it increased by about three and a half percent, which is $2 billion. And Rick, one of the interesting things that I don't think we'll see get reported in too many places is that it's actually based on a revenue estimate that's $208 million less than last year. And so we're anticipating that we're gonna not see the kind of revenue growth that we've had over the last several years. And, and this is an adjustment and a reality check to get us back in line with normal kinds of budget increases. So I think that's a, a very prudent thing to do. What isn't prudent is that we divert uh, some of the dollars that we get from capital gains in this budget, which would normally go into the stabilization fund. We divert some of those dollars to close that gap. Because as I mentioned, we use a $208 million lower revenue estimate and to fill that, uh, we take some money from capital gains, which would normally go into the stabilization fund. So a couple of moving pieces here, but uh, the good news is that uh, we will have a budget very shortly and the budget uh, maintains a very modest increase and uh, we're still gonna have issues to deal with as the fiscal year unfolds, but hopefully soon we'll have a budget. I know that Bill's uh, suggested bills come from the floor, from both the Senate and, and the House. How much uh, does the governor have an input into uh, budget or, or bills in general? The governor actually has a lot of input in, and that's reflective of the collaborative way that government operates in Massachusetts. So with regard to the budget, um, she takes the first shot and proposes the budget back in January. And then the House gets it after that and takes it up. And then the Senate after that. And as I just mentioned, when we're done reconciling our different versions of the budget, it goes back to the governor's desk. So 
the governor has a lot of official input and a lot of unofficial input as the process unfolds. And, and that's one of the things that I'm most pleased about with regard to Massachusetts state government is there is that interaction between all of the stakeholders. And the other thing that's significant, Rick, is that in anticipation of not having a budget done for the beginning of the fiscal year, we actually passed an interim budget, which spends for a month at the, the amounts that would have been spent in the prior year so that we wouldn't have a government shutdown. And while it's not uncommon for us to read in the newspaper or listen to the radio or see on television threats of a federal government shutdown, that really doesn't happen in Massachusetts because we agree to that safety valve so that there isn't the threat that state government would be shut down. And I'm pretty proud of that in the way that we operate in that regard. All right, in um, your agenda, you talked about um, conference committees. Maybe you could explain what they are and what the significance is in terms of timing. Absolutely, and conference committees are one of the most important parts of the legislative process. We've talked about it a little bit before, but it bears repeating and, and helping folks to understand, Rick, because conference committees are the way that the House and Senate resolve the differences of the bills they pass. So generally speaking, the House and the Senate pass different versions of a bill that touches on the same subject matter. We, we usually have agreement, we're gonna address the economy or we're gonna address housing. But as you can imagine, we have two different versions. And so we appoint three members of the House and three members of the Senate, and those six people work to reconcile the different versions of a bill on the same subject. And when they're through, and hopefully they do finish the job, what they produce is known as a conference committee report, which is essentially the final version of the bill on that subject. Now the conference committee report has to be accepted by the House and by the Senate, and you cannot amend it. So when the conference committee report comes back from the conference committee, the House gets one vote, the Senate gets one vote, it's either up or down on the entire package. You can vote no, you could try to uh, send the bill back to the conference committee, but essentially your options are very limited at that point. And the reason that I brought that up off air, Rick, was because we are now into the point where we only have a limited time left in our formal session. So our formal sessions for this year end at the end of July. Now we still meet after that because the constitution requires the House and the Senate to meet every 72 hours. But under our rules, after we go into informal session, we don't take up matters that are controversial and we don't take roll call votes. And any member can object in an informal session to something coming up that doesn't meet those criteria. Now, some of the bills are critically important with regard to what I just said, because for instance, we have a conference committee that just got appointed on an economic development bill. A lot of that economic development bill contains authorizations for bonded spending. And those require a two thirds roll call vote at enactment. So if we don't get a conference committee report by the end of July, that bill will effectively have died uh, unless by some miracle, it comes back in the first week of January because we're in informal session until then. The same is true for the housing bond bill. It has a lot of money in it, bonded authorizations for our local housing authorities, which desperately need funds to be able to make uh, needed repairs and address deferred maintenance. That won't happen unless the conference committee reports back by the end of July. And we also have a, a conference committee operating on veterans and veterans benefits. Um, I have a couple of pieces that are in the Senate version of that bill, which are very important. One would look at trying to create a sliding scale to provide property tax relief for veterans based on their percentage of service-connected disability. And the other one would give proper recognition to our merchant Marines um, who oftentimes have served in wartime uh, and made tremendous sacrifice, but they've never been properly recognized in Massachusetts for their service. The federal government has recently taken some steps to recognize them, and that's great, but Massachusetts should as well. So we have a number of, of conference committees. In fact, Rick, I keep looking down because I'm trying to get a count. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six conference committees that are currently meeting, all with a deadline of July 31st. And we're going to come right down to the wire on getting some of these things done. 
Um, there's another committee on information technology, a conference committee that I was sitting on. It just completed its work. And so now that conference committee will dissolve after we consider the conference committee report. So a lot of moving pieces, and I apologize for throwing all this information out there, but there's a lot to grasp and digest. I'm not taking the test or the quizzes or the exams. <laughs> I'm just going to drop the course. <laughs> All right, we, a while back, you talked about abandoned fishing gear and how important it is to deal with that. What's the status of that? So I'm glad you asked, Rick, because this is one of the items. It's in its own bill, which is currently in the Senate Ways and Means Committee after being reported out favorably by the Natural Resources Committee. But... I added it as an amendment to the economic development bill with the unanimous support of my colleagues. And so we're hoping that the conference committee will include it in the final version of the bill. And you'll recall from our prior conversations, Rick, that the purpose of this is to authorize the Division of Marine Fisheries to enact regulations that will allow us to get abandoned fishing gear out of the water uh, because it ghost fishes and, and no one tends that gear because it's abandoned. It also poses a tremendous threat of entanglement to right whales and other marine mammals. And this is a long overdue update to our law. And I've got fingers crossed that we're gonna be able to get it over the goal line by the end of July. All right. Finally, Senator Tarr, uh, a veteran in Gloucester, well-known, uh, who's worked a lot for, for other veterans in the city has uh, retired from the American Legion post. And um, I know that you, as always, are involved when in, in, in commendations. Well, you know, Rick, I can't say enough about Commander Mark Nestor, who is now retired commander or past commander, Mark Nestor of the American Legion Lester S. Wasp Post 3 in Gloucester. But, you know, Rick, a lot of organizations, <laughs> oh, excuse me, like our veterans organizations, are struggling to maintain membership and to keep the lights on and keep the door open. Mark Nestor came on the scene at Gloucester's American Legion 11 years ago, and he was just what the post needed. He gave the post purpose, he gave it vision, he gave it leadership. And Rick, like with many organizations, there were a lot of people involved in the Legion, but they needed someone to be the catalyst for all of that goodwill and all of that willingness to go forward and do some things, and do some things this post has. As you know, because we've talked about it in the past, the Post now serves meals uh, that get delivered on Easter and Thanksgiving and Christmas. The Post is of tremendous help with our toy drive every year and collects literally thousands of toys for kids. It does a veterans breakfast on Sunday morning to provide camaraderie and socialization for our veterans. And one of the more significant things that Commander Nestor needs to be commended for is the rehabilitation of the Legion building. Now, you and I live in Gloucester. I know you walk a lot around the city. I drive a lot around the city. And we've noticed over the years the deterioration of the Legion building, which is an icon. And it's one of the first things you see as you come into our downtown on Washington Street. It needed to be revitalized. And Commander Nestor committed himself to that project. Mayor Verga deserves a tremendous amount of credit, as does the city council, for committing to revitalize that building. I was happy to work with uh, my colleague, Representative Ann Margaret Ferranti, and we secured state funding. And boy, what an honor it was to walk into that building yesterday to honor Commander Nestor. And I had to walk under scaffolding because it was up, because that building is actually going to get the repairs that it needs. A great veteran, a great individual, a great leader. And what an honor it was yesterday to join with the mayor and the members of the Post and others to honor Mark Nestor.